All right, so we're going to talk about nursing care of the child with a GU disorder, genitourinary um, GU, if you want to get through it quickly. Um, this area focuses on a couple of different more urinary symptoms and then more renal symptoms. So um, we're going to talk about both um, areas. Y urinary tract infections are probably going to be one of the most common things that you see in the urinary um, realm of it. Uh, renal failure, nephrotic syndrome are going to be hypertension are going to be some things that you see in the renal aspect of it. Okay, So some differences in the physiology and anatomy of kids. Um, the, one of the big things is their urethra is still very short, so it puts them at um, increased risk for UTIs. Um, bladder capacity, a newborn has a bladder capacity of one ounce. Um, and it, this blew me away. It increases to the adult size by a year. So by a year, the bladder is what it is, pretty much. Some lab work that you'll see done with um, renal kids or, or G, GU kids, um, urinalysis, looking for UTI, looking for protein in the urine, looking for glucose in the urine, um, CBC, BUN, electrolytes. Those of you that have taken care of adult renal patients, very similar renal failure in kids, renal failure in adults. It's one of the few things that is pretty similar. So um, you'll see BUN, creatinine, electrolytes, looking for potassium, etc. in kids. Creatinine clearance, you'll see that as well. Um, like 24-hour urine collections, looking for protein, looking for creatinine. And um, those are a little less common, but you do see them. A cystoscopy or a VCUG, if you have a patient with um, reflux, kidney reflux, that's what that's how they find that. Ultrasound, um, IVPs, those are looking for structural anomalies, and then a renal biopsy, looking for um, tumors, things like that. Some urinary disorders are, and these are more urinary um, in nature. Bladder extrusive, ex, yeah, bladder's born on the outside of the body. That's what that is. Hypospadias, epispadias, surgical uh, fixes. That's where the urethral opening is either on the top of the penis or the bottom of the penis. And this is only in males. Um, some obstructive uropathy, uh, Kidney stones, you don't really see kidney stones in kids that much, but there can be some structural um, things that cause some obstruction. Um, hydronephrosis, we'll talk about that, and then reflux. Um, that's one of the most common things that you find if you have a child with a recurrent UTI. Um, we talked about UTI enuresis. Enuresis is nocturnal enuresis is bedwetting. Enuresis is loss of bladder control. Um, nephrotic syndrome, we'll talk quite a bit about that. Acute glomerulonephritis, that can be after a strep infection. Um, that's the most common form of that. Hemolytic uremic syndrome can be caused by the E. coli bacteria, and it's pretty serious. And then renal failure, acute and chronic. Renal failure um, can be, acute renal failure can be caused by septic shock, can be caused by de severe dehydration, um, and it is usually reversible, uh, or it progresses into chronic renal failure. All right, some sites. There's, there's some really good pictures in the text about um, the different places, common sites of obstructive uropathy. Uropathy. There are a lot of words in this chapter that I get tongue-tied over, so bear with me. Ureteropelvic junction, the UPJ obstruction, um, is a block the pelvis of the kidney to the ureter. Um, by the way, you do not need to know these locations, okay? Um, not for testing purposes. There you go. Ureteroviscal junction. The UVJ obstruction, uh, the lower ureter to the bladder, that's where the obstruction is there. Ureterocele is the ureter swells into the bladder um, and it makes a little bubble in the bladder. And posterior urethral valves, you only see this in males, it's like an extra flap of tissue 
um, in the proximal urethra. Here is a good graphic of reflux, and basically it's just, oh, you can't see my little pointer, but um, it's urine going back up in to the kidney, backing, backing up, because that one-way valve doesn't close all the way. A renal failure, like I said, in kids is, is pretty much like in adults. It's where kidneys can't concentrate urine, um, electrolytes are all jacked up, you retain potassium, you retain fluids, can't get out the waste products. It can be acute or chronic. Uh, acute resolves and then chronic. If acute doesn't resolve, then it develops into chronic or end-stage renal disease. Um, in stage renal disease, you end up either with dialysis, per peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, or a kidney transplant. Uh, some reproductive organ disorders, we're going to talk about this as well in this chapter. Um, labial adhesions, we see that a lot in little girls, um, like babies. Their labia are actually kind of fused together. Um, you treat that with Primarin cream and it will open those up. Also, you can have adhesions like on little boys, their penis gets some adhesions right around the top of it. Um, those are little, you can't really treat those with anything. Um, a lot of times, those just have to be manually uh, de adhesed. I don't know what the right word is, but um, sometimes, most of the time, it's pretty easy to do that but sometimes it gets a little, um, let me see what's the right word, forceful is not the right word, um, it gets a little intense when those are being released, so I've seen a phys one of our pediatricians do that before, and it doesn't look like it's much fun. Um, real important then to teach parents to retract the skin over the penis when they clean it, make sure that it, it stays unadhesed. Um, sexually transmitted infections, PID, we'll talk a little bit about that, and some menstrual disorders. Okay, so they kind of lump a lot of stuff in this chapter. All right, vulv vulvovaginitis. Um, basically, that is just a, it can be a yeast infection. Um, it can be just irritation from wet clothing, poor hygiene, uh, irritation from bubble baths and things like that. So just anything that... Um, causes inflammation in the vaginal area of females. PID, what does PID look like? Well, PID, usually they, they come in with uh, abdominal pain or discharge, uh, fever, uh, if they're having pain with their menstrual cycles, any kind of abnormal uterine bleeding, those can all be manifestations of PID. Long-term complications um, can result in infertility if not treated. Some male reproductive disorders, phimosis and paraphimosis, we'll talk about that. Uh, cryptorchidism, cryptorchidism, sorry, um, that is undescended testicles. Hydrocele variceles, those are um, when the muscle in the groin area doesn't close all the way and fluid leaks down into the testicles sac, um, it can cause an enlargement. Um, hydrocele's are pretty common in infants. They usually resolve by about one year or they have to be surgically. Um, that tissue in there, those muscles have to be surgically, in the groin have to be surgically kind of connected so that the fluid doesn't move back and forth between the abdominal cavity and testicle. Testicular torsion is a surgical emergency. If it is a true testicular torsion, it can result in the loss of the testicle. And basically, it's what it sounds like. If um, a male gets hit in the testicles in that twist, then that can cut off the blood supply of the testicle and they can lose that testicle. Um, so if a patient comes in with testicular pain, they are a very high priority. An ultrasound is done pretty quickly, and um, we just make sure there's good blood flow to the testicle. Epididymitis and sexually transmitted infections. Epididymitis is just an um, inflammation or infection of the epididymis, and um, sexually transmitted infections are exactly what they sound like. 
All right, sometimes um, parents choose to have their little boy circumcised. Sometimes they don't. That's their choice. Some benefits of um, circumcision, decreased uh, incidence of UTI. You can use your imagination. You know, if there's a lot of extra skin there, bacteria can get under there. Um, and since they have such a short urethra, they can... Uh, inch their way back up there and cause some UTI. So there is a decreased incidence of UTI if a boy is circumcised. Um, complications, you know, I've seen some botched circumcisions too. So um, there are some complications that occur can occur from circumcision. Um, epididymitis. Okay, epididymitis is an inflammation of the epididymis. It causes, it's caused by bacteria. Um, pain in the scrotum is what you see, pain and swelling, big big time swelling, not as a result of trauma. Um, rarely occurs in little boys, and then they treat it with an antibiotic. Testicular torsion we talked about. Um, immediate surgery if it's proven that it is a testicular torsion, and I mean pretty darn quick. Like we do the ultrasound, we see it's torsion, you're in surgery. All right, some things to look for when you're doing an assessment with um, GU disorders. You want to look at past medical history, including um, maternal history, um, hypertension. Um, if there's any of that that runs in the family, you need to know about that. Neonatal history. Um, there's some things, chromosome abnormalities, congenital malformation. A lot of syndromes in um, encompass the kidney or, in, or the kidney is included in some of the, the defects so um, like horseshoe kidneys, single kidneys, um, things like that so we'll probably you would probably know that as a result of an ultrasound that was done before the baby was born so um, neonatal history, past medical history, really important. Family history of renal disease or chronic UTIs or kidney stones or hypertension, that's all important to know as well. All right, so what are we looking for when we are assessing the GU system? Um, one of the most common things you'll see, and we are going to spend a lot of um, time on UTIs, um, burning on urination, burning, frequency, um, urgency, um, a child that was potty trained and now all of a sudden is wetting the bed, those are all signs and symptoms of a UTI. Um, foul smelling urine, any kind of discharge, any kind of pain, blood in the urine, and edema. Edema goes along with nephrotic syndrome, renal failure, um, so you're going to make sure that you assess for that as well. On a little one, on a baby, a good place to assess for edema is on the sacrum. So sacral edema, periorbital edema, you're looking for all that. You're also going to look for any um, masses in the groin, um, one testicle is larger than the other, uh, flank or abdominal pain, distension. It could be um, as a result of some ascites from renal failure, um, nausea, vomiting, poor failure to thrive, um, any kind of in infectious exposure and prenatal infectious exposure as well. All right, so what are we going to treat them with? Well, we use a lot of different meds in um, the kidney world, the renal world. Um, antibiotics, of course, to treat a UTI. Um, anticholinergics, DDAVP helps with bedwetting. Diuretics, if you have renal failure, you know that you're on a lot of diuretics. And in addition to that, you're usually on some potassium, maybe, unless your potassium is high. So you have to make sure that you keep an eye on those electrolytes. Corticosteroids, that's what they use to treat nephrotic syndrome. Um, Antihypertensives, um, along with renal stuff. Ren uh, kidneys control blood pressure. Kidneys control um red blood cell production, so you can think of the things that go with kidney disease or renal disease, um, hypertension, anemia, etc. Um, immunosuppressants for renal transplants, and then albumin, um, if you have hypoalbuminemia, I probably had too many syllables in it, um, then you would give some albumin. 
All right, so how do we treat all of these disorders? Well, urinary diversion can be used to reimplant the ureters in the abdominal wall. Um, obstructive issues can um, result in that. Foley catheter, you'll see not so much a Foley indwelling catheter, but you might see a lot of in and out catheters, unless it's something like a, a neurotic syndrome where they have to keep a really close eye on INO, then you might see an indwelling Foley catheter. Ureteral stents to correct any kind of obstruct obstructive issue. Um, okay, so my favorite is the appendico vesicostomy. This is the only good use that I can think of for the appendix. So what they do in an appendico vesicostomy, other than being a really cool word, is they take the appendix and they make a bladder out of the appendix and they make a stoma right in the suprapubic area and put that appendix slash bladder right behind there and that's and then they divert the ureters into there and that's where your bladder is well and it's a self cath situation through the stoma on the um from the outside but um that's about the only good use for the appendix that i've ever heard um, dialysis, you'll see peritoneal dialysis, you'll see hemodialysis in kids. All right, we're going to skip the question. Hemolytic uremic syndrome. Um, this is a pretty serious situation. It's usually caused by E. coli. It usually starts with a diarrhea type illness. Uh, bloody diarrhea happens after that. Um, characterized by three things, hemolytic, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and acute renal failure. Um, some other different causes, it can be inherited, um, transplantation can cause it, um, it can be just idiopathic. Who knows what causes it? But majority of the time, I think, I don't know if any of y'all are old enough to remember, but up in Seattle at a Jack in the Box restaurant, they had a break at a uh, outbreak of E. coli 157 um, and that caused a bunch of people to get hemolytic uremic syndrome. Oops. All right, nursing care for end-stage renal disease patients. Now, like I said, renal disease in kids is very similar to renal disease in adults, um, but you have the growth and development Thing thrown in there. So you have a chronic illness in a child that's trying to maintain and mature through the growth and development stages. So you have to really focus on that. Um, these guys are hospitalized a lot, so monitoring growth and development is very important. Um, of course, we want to remove waste products and maintain fluid balance, and that's usually done through dialysis. Um, but there's a lot of psychosocial pieces to this as well. Um, fluid nutrition, daily weights, um, supporting and educating the family, lots of education to be done. All right, enuresis, or, well, nocturnal enuresis is bedwetting, um, but primary enuresis is, is they never were potty trained. Secondary is they were, um, but now they're not. And diurnal is daytime loss of urinary control, and nocturnal is nighttime bedwetting. A lot of times nocturnal is, um, and diurnal as well, are psychological issues. Um, some things you can do to restore fluid electrolyte balance in renal or GU patients. Um, monitor your vital signs. Check your blood pressure. Check your heart rate. Um, daily weights. Um, ensure your diet. Okay, so with these patients, you've learned about renal diets, low salt, uh, low potassium, low phosphorus. Um, so you have to make sure that you maintain that the diet um, requirements. Uh, fluids, sometimes they're on fluid restrictions. They try not to restrict kids' fluids, but if the nephrotic syndrome or the renal failure is bad enough and the edema and the weight gain, then they will do a fluid restriction. Strict, strict, strict INO, okay? Weigh those diapers, um, put a hat in the toilet, make sure your patient's measuring all of their intake and output. Um, diuretics if they're ordered, um, hyperkalemia, you um, 
with hyperkalemia, you have your vital signs can be affected. Your heart rate is going to be very slow. Um, your EKG tracing is going to be really messed up. So monitor for signs of that. Um, I would know, and this is just in general, like for the NCLEX, know your signs and symptoms of all your hypers and hypos. Okay, just commit that to memory right now if you haven't. Hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypernatremia, hyponatremia, calcemias, phosphatemias, um, albuminemias. Okay, know all those. No hyper and no hypo. Um, if they need blood, then you may be giving blood, and then dialysis may become necessary as well. Alright, so let's go to our chapter. Alright, so this is a pretty long chapter. I'm going to try to keep it brief. Um, there are a few things that we're not going to touch on, um, but the main one... Um, Main ones are renal failure, uh, nephrotic syndrome, UTIs, epispadias, hypospadias. Um, I'll let you know. Okay, some structural differences. We talked about that. The main thing being that um, the urethra is short, which increases their risk of UTIs. There's bladder capacity again. Um, here is a little bit more in-depth chart about common medical treatments and what nursing implications are and again these charts give you a lot of good information so um, there you go urinary diversion uh, bladder extra ex, I can never say it extra fee we're just gonna leave it at that um, can result in the need for a urinary diversion polycatheter stents we talked about all those there's the appendico viscostomy All right, medications. This gives us a little bit more information about medications. Um, anticholinergic agents um, can be used with bedwetting. Um, antibiotics, you'll see those a lot with UTIs. Um, they all, Also, they have to do, okay, well, when we talk about lab tests and things like that, urine cultures are going to give us a sensitivity so that we can make sure that we prescribe the right antibiotic. So, um, Antibiotics, for the most part, for UTIs are oral, but if they have a E. coli or if they have um, something that's not susceptible to any kind of the PO antibiotics, then they may be have they may have to be hospitalized for IV antibiotics. Kids with um, an advanced UTI or maybe even a pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis is not mentioned in this chapter, but pyelonephritis is pretty darn bad. Um, it's actually when the infection goes from the bladder, the urinary tract, up into the kidneys. These kids are fairly sick. Um, fevers, flank pain, chills. Um, they're usually hospitalized if they have a bad pylo. We call it pylo, pylonephritis. So they usually are hospitalized with IV antibiotics. Um, desmopressin. Desmopressin. Um, nocturnal enuresis. That helps with that. DDAVP is another name for that. Corticosteroids, you see that used with nef in nephrotic syndrome. Uh, immunosuppressants with nephrotic syndrome. Um, or, I think, nope, it's not down there. Um, immunosuppressants with kidney transplants as well. Um, ACE inhibitors, different kind of blood pressure medications to treat hypertension. Diuretics, you'll see Lasix, you'll see hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, and again, potassium, watch your potassium levels with those. Um, and then there's some different blood pressure medications. Um, health history, here's some great information to get when you're assessing for health history. Physical exam, um, you're going to, if you're suspecting like a pyelonephritis, make sure you palpate or tap over the CVA, the costo vertebral angle and uh, make sure you listen to the belly before you start palpating and percussing. 
All right, some lab work. Your CBC, of course, it's going to be elevated. Your white blood cell count is going to be elevated with the UTI. Your hemoglobin and hematocrit might be decreased with renal failure um, so because it does lead to anemia. BUN and creatinine, watch those. That tells you kidney function. Um, potassium and other electrolytes with renal failure, you're going to see a high potassium because it can't be eliminated. And with a high potassium, you're going to see a very low heart rate. There's the indications of phosphorus and calcium and protein. Put those to memory. Urine culture and sensitivity, like I talked about, we have to make sure we're treating with the right antibiotics. So culture and sensitivity, very important. Uh, VCUG and IVPs, they are diagnostic tests looking for um, kidney reflux with the VCUG. IVPs are looking for uh, obstructive disorders. Um, in adults, I think they use those to look for kidney stones. And then renal ultrasound looking for um, hydronephrosis or tumors on the kidneys, cyst on the kidneys, polycystic kidney disease, things like that. All right, so when you're getting a urine sample, um, if you don't need a culture, then you could use a urine bag. Um, this shows you how to use it. We call it a U-bag. Um, much easier to put on a boy than a girl, um, but this is an option of collecting a urine. Um, here's some cat size calves that you want to use in adult. I mean, in a, in a child, we have, I think we have five French and eight French in and out catheters. Um, those are probably two of the most common kind, but these are the common sizes. These are sizes of indwelling catheters. Kind of gives you an idea of what size you want to use on what age patient. Um, there's some nursing diagnosis, of course, fluid volume excess or fluid volume, uh, well, fluid volume excess, um, impaired urinary elimination, of course, risk for infection. Those are all very appropriate. All right, so let's talk about some structural disorders. Bladder extrophy. That was pretty good. Um, it's when the bladder is born on the outside or when the patient is born with a bladder on the outside. I have never personally seen one of these, but it is a surgical um, emergency. Um, complications, infection, um, nursing assessment, of course, you will be able to see that when the baby's born. So this is not something that's just discovered. Um, nursing management, the whole goal of this is to prevent infection, both pre-op and post-op. Um, so you make sure that um, stool goes downward. Make sure you keep stool out of that area, both pre-op and post-op. Um, and they will end up with um, a stoma. So lots of parent teaching with this. Um, here's a picture of hypospadias and epispadias. And these are surgically fixed as well. Um, you want the opening to the urethra to be right in the middle where it's supposed to be with hypospadias. It is on the bottom, hypo under, and then epispadias, it's on the dorsal side. So remember hypo and, and epi. Um, again, one of the goals after um, post-operative care is um, infection control. All right, there's, I have never double diapered a baby, but um, there's how to double diaper a baby if you're ever given that order. Um, obstructive uropathy, this gives you some pictures of the different locations that we talked about, UPJ and UVJ. It's much easier to say than the big long word. Um, here's a ureterocele down in the bladder. And then um, there's where posterior valves are located. And again, that's only in a male. Um, what you're going to see with any of these kids with obstructive disorders are recurrent UTIs. So if you have a patient that has a recurrent UTI, they, especially if they're babies, they get a workup and they'll get a sonogram and, and they'll get a VCUG and um, looking for structural or uh, obstructive things going on. Um, so they'll get a full workup. 
Um, okay, what's next? Hydronephrosis. Okay, hydronephrosis can be congenital. It can be secondary to reflux. If you have a grade 5 reflux and it goes undiscovered for a long time, then you can have some hydronephrosis. Um, hydronephrosis, if it advances to that stage, can it really cause some issues. Hypertension, eventually renal failure, and the need for a renal or kidney transplant. Um, so here's some things to look for. With a patient with hydronephrosis, failure to thrive, um, blood in the urine, any kind of mass in the abdomen, um, and signs and symptoms of a UTI, fever, vomiting. With little ones, it's hard to tell if they have a UTI because they can't tell you, oh, it burns when I pee. Um, so you need to look for things like poor feeding, irritability, fever or no fever, fever or you know low temp that can be um, a uroseptic type situation. Same thing in really old people. <laughs> That's what um, you see as like a low temperature. Geriatric patients, sorry. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about reflux. Reflux is, um, sometimes it resolves um, if it's grade one, um, very minor, but a lot of times if it's three through five, then you usually have to do um, some sort of surgical reimplantation of the ureters. Um, oh yeah, there it is right there, three through five. They take them apart from the bladder and they put them somewhere else in the bladder to make sure that that little valve is, is functioning like it should. Um, health history, again, you're gonna see recurrent UTIs. Um, if they have a single episode, of a UTI in a male, then they then they immediately go to um, the the renal doc or the and they go and have a sonogram and they have the full workup. Um, sometimes one or two UTIs in a female. I don't know if that you'll get a full workup, but um, after that, if you have two or three, then definitely they'll send you on for a, a full GU workup. Uh, nursing management course prevent infection that's always the way it is especially after surgery um, there's some interventions there that can help um, BNO suppositories for bladder spasms because those can be very painful um, if they've reimplanted your ureters into a different place on your bladder um, it can definitely cause some bladder spasms all right UTIs most common urinary complaint that you'll see with kids um, bacteria, because their urethras are so short, um, bacteria can creep up there and cause a UTI. Um, if a UTI advances in stage, it's pyelonephritis. E. coli is the most common cause, and you can just structurally think about, you know, that's, that makes sense. Um, Poor hygiene practices, either on purpose or not on purpose. Little girls that are being potty trained, you know, don't always wipe like they should. Um, you should wipe front to back. You should teach your children to wipe front to back, but that's not the normal, you know, that's not the normal flow of what usually happens. So um, lots of teaching opportunities here. Usually UTIs are treated with oral antibiotics, but again, if it's a um, bacteria that's not um, susceptible to anything oral, then um, IV antibiotics sometimes have to be used. It's usually about a 10-day course, 7 to 14. Um, lots of fluid to kind of flush that out. Good teaching. Lots of hygiene practices. Um, things that you're going to see with a UTI. Um, you're going to see fever, belly pain, nausea, vomiting, possibly belly, um, flank pain. If it's progressing up into a pyelonephritis, you may see more flank pain, poor feeding, um, fussiness, urgency, frequency, accidents. Um, those are all signs and symptoms of a UTI. Okay. Um, lab that you might see, you'll see a UA. You'll see, hopefully, a urine culture. Um, some prevention. Okay, so this, this is important. Um, 
you'll need this for teaching for your parents. Lots of fluids. Um, avoid colas and caffeines, which irritate the bladder. Lo encourage them to go to the bathroom a lot, so the more water you can pump in them, the better. Uh, wipe from front to back. Cotton underwear. No bubble baths. Take a shower. Um, take a bath or take a shower daily. Um, of course, change tampons and pads um, if a girl's on her period. Those are all teaching things that you need to know for um, UTIs. All right, enuresis. Enuresis is um, incontinence, incontinence of urine, technically. Diurnal is during the day and nocturnal is at night. Nocturnal usually goes away by about age six or seven. If it doesn't, then um, you need to start investigating. And like I said, a lot of that can be psychosocial, um, family disruption, other stressors. Chronic constipation can also cause some enuresis. Um, so keep that in mind. There's our definitions again. So what you're going to teach the parents? You're going to teach the parents to cut off the fluids at a decent hour at night. Um, don't make sure that the parents don't um, belittle the child. Okay, sometimes it's not their fault. Uh, most of the time, it's not their fault. So make them aware that um, they need to be supportive of their kids. A lot, there's a lot of psychosocial stuff that goes along with bedwetting, things like that. Um, behavioral interventions for enuresis. There's some um, evidence-based practice that you can share with your parents. There are some meds that you can that can be prescribed that will reduce, um, especially the nocturnal enuresis, DDAVP is one, uh, or desmopressin. There's a monitor. They do have monitors that you can um, use in the bed that goes off at the first sign of wetness and it wakes the child up. Um, so I don't know how successful they've been, but they do exist. All right, some acquired disorders that mess with your renal function. Nephrotic syndrome is the first one at list. Um, so it can be congenital. It can be, there's that word, idiopathic. We don't know what it is. Uh, what it's from, and then it can be secondary to another illness. Um, congenital is an inherited. A prognosis is usually not good. Um, it can occur from um, other ill illnesses like lupus, like HSP, Henox, Shinelin, Purpura, or uh, from a diabetic situation. Uh, Henox, Shinelin, Purpura, HSP. Uh, I'm not sure that it addresses that anywhere in the text, but what that is is, well, they don't know what causes that, but it's a kind of a breakdown of the capillaries, um, and one of the things that you can see as a result of it is um, big purpura areas on dependent um, parts of the body like the feet or like the buttocks, um, and then a complication of it can be nephrotic syndrome. Um, okay, most of the the nephrotic syndrome you see is idiopathic. We don't know what causes it, but some complications are anemia, risk for infection, um, and eventually renal failure. Um, pathophysiology, I do want you to read through that path pathophysiology. Um, you may have learned about it in your patho class, but I know it's been a while. All right, so how do we manage it? We manage it with steroids usually. Um, that sometimes um, increases the glomerulo capability, um, but then you have all the side effects of corticosteroids, so it's kind of a catch-22. You can also use immunosuppressants um, like cyclosporin um, if it's severe enough. All right, what are you going to see? What's it going to look like? It's going to look like that poor baby right there. Um, lots of edema, periorbital, periorbital edema, sacral edema, um, nausea, vomiting, daily weights. You know, parents just say they're gaining weight and gaining weight. They look like their skin is all tight. Uh, lots of third spacing. Their bellies can be really big with ascites. Um, so it's... 
it's a sad little situation. Document daily um, height and well and weight. The weight is the most Im important thing. You can also see some high blood pressure with it. Um, it usually will be elevated in the kiddo with nephrotic syndrome, so you may have medical management of the hypertension as well. You're also going to see protein proteinuria. Um, your urine is full of protein. Your serum protein will be um, low, and your albumin levels will be low. Um, BUN and creatinine may be affected later on in nephrotic syndrome. All right, so what do you want to do for them? You want to get the fluid off them. So you're going to have some diuretic therapy. Um, it says usually it's Lasix, and it is, but then you have to monitor potassium as well. Um, but potassium can be a slippery slope because if you have some renal failure, you're retaining potassium anyway. So daily, um, Chemistries are usually ordered on these kiddos. Alright, if you have hypoalbuminemia, you may have to give some IV albumin. And again, they'll monitor this very closely with their electrolytes, usually daily. Uh, preventing infection, if you're on corticosteroids and you're on uh, immunosuppressants, then that sets you up for... Um, infection, every other kind of infection, so you have to have good hand washing, etc. Um, immunizations are very important. Make sure you don't um, expose your child to any kids that are not immunized. Um, educating the family emotional support are really important because a lot of times these kids um, progress on into renal failure. Um, acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. What a fun word that one is. That usually happens after a strep infection. And the way we know that is they come in with all the signs and symptoms of fever, you know, edema, decreased urine output, sometimes blood in the urine, um, all of those symptoms. Um, what they'll do is they'll draw what's called an ASO titer. And if the ASO titer is positive, then we know that we're dealing with a acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Um, you also want to, with any um, fluid overload sit situation, you want to make sure you do a good respiratory assessment. With fluid volume overload, you might hear a lot of fluid in the lungs, a lot of crackles in the lungs. Um, so with any of these renal disorders, you want to make sure that you're assessing lung sounds very good and very frequently. Um, you will have some high blood pressure with um, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, so you treat it, treat with anti-hypertensives. Um, um, a lot of times the diuretics that they give will take care of the blood pressure, especially if it's like HCTZ. Um, okay, hemolytic uremic syndrome, we talked about this, usually caused by E. coli. Usually uh, a precursor is a diarrhea event, a serious bloody diarrhea um, event. So um, if you have a patient that comes in with that, make sure that someone addresses the kidney situation. Um, what you're going to see. You're going to see an elevated BUN and creatinine. You will see uh, some anemia because of the blood loss and because of the kidney involvement. Um, also a bunch of different lab values you can see right there. Hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, uh, metabolic acidosis. This is a, this is a pretty serious situation. Um, what do you want to do? You want to maintain your fluid balance. Um, probably you're going to give some blood. Um, monitor H and H. You're going to have a very fatigued, pale-looking patient. Um, so they uh, usually end up on dialysis. Um, get some blood. Fluid volume balance is important. Monitoring electrolytes is important, um, and preventing the spread of it because it is spread by bacteria. Um, you want to make sure that you do a lot of good teaching cooking meats, hand washing, etc. All right, renal failure. Um, renal failure is, again, one of two types, either acute or chronic. Um, acute can be caused by um, sepsis. It can be caused by um, hypovolemic shock. It can ca be caused by 
um, septic shock, those are all things, and they are reversible. Um, so unless they get to the point that they are just advanced too much and then they go to chronic, uh, advance into chronic renal failure. Um, complications of acute and chronic renal failure, same thing, anemia, hypertension, um, pulmonary edema, make sure you listen to those lung sounds. Um, cardiac failure, you're going to have some electrolyte imbalances. Um, so again, your EKG tracings are going to be very um, abnormal. You're going to have a low heart rate if you have a high potassium, um, etc. If your sodium is out of whack, you can have seizures. Um, so monitor those electrolytes very closely. Um, signs and symptoms. Edema is not listed on here, but with renal failure, you usually have some edema. Um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, everything's got that as a, as a health history or as a assessment finding. Um, decreased urine output, that's a, a biggie. Um, crackles in the lungs, another biggie. But your lab work is going to show you what you need to know. All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to monitor the hypertension. We're going to try to restore the electrolyte balance and the fluid balance, but again, be very careful. You don't want a fluid overload. Um, we're going to provide the family education, fluid restriction, diet control, low salt diet, um, low potassium diet, etc. And then we have end-stage renal disease. Um, the only way to fix end-stage renal disease is you either dialyze forever or you get a kidney transplant. Um, most of the time, well, in adults, you think about what causes chronic renal failure or end-stage renal disease. Diabetes, um, long-standing history of hypertension, those are things that cause it in adult. With kids, it's a little different. Um, it's Most of the time, it's congenital. It's some sort of structural, obstructive situation. Um, or it can be, you know, as, as a result of like lupus or a severe shocky situation, septic shock, if they're really septic. So adults are different causes for, in, adults have different causes for end-stage renal disease, uh, but the treatment and the management is usually the same. It's really close to the same. Um, health history, again, you want to know you know, what led up to this point, uh, previous illnesses, immunization status. Uh, really important to monitor these kids on the growth charts um, because you need to see any trending upward or downward. Um, here's some meds that you might give with an um, end-stage renal patient. A vitamin D and calcium because you have to correct those electrolyte imbalances. Um, you might give iron or you might give erythropoietin um, for your anemia. Um, acidosis occurs, so bisitra or sodium bicarb might be um, needed. Um, and then these kids are usually on dialysis, either hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Now, peritoneal dialysis can be done at home. Um, it can be continuous or it can be um, just done at night. Now, hemodialysis, okay, let's go back to peritoneal dialysis. Um, peritoneal dialysis, basically, there's a, um, a catheter in the belly. Fluid is put in. It's a, a fluid that uh, will pull out the toxins in the body. So fluid goes in, sucks up all of those, um, those pathogens, those waste products, and then comes back out. Now, when I was on the renal floor, I was on the renal floor when I first came out of nursing school, and um, this was a huge, big machine with big old bags of fluid that you had to change out during the night. It has really evolved, especially with kids. So um, parents do it at home, um, usually overnight, you know, eight hours while they sleep much more compact and manageable system nowadays. Um, your peritoneal dialysis catheter, like I said, comes out of the skin like that. It's tunneled under the skin with all of these little openings in there. When the fluid goes in, it, it goes into the peritoneal cavity. Um, 
just because of the osmo osmosis, it pulls in the um, waste products and then it comes back out. It's a really um, kind of interesting process to, work, to watch. Now hemodialysis, let's talk a little bit about that. Hemodialysis usually is done through an AV fistula graft in the, in the arm. Um, one of the things you want to do if you have a patient with one of these grafts is you want to make sure that you assess that. Make sure you feel the thrill, hear the brewy. Um, that if you haven't ever done that, um, the thrill feels like a, just something pushing through a big vessel and the brewery actually you can hear that I know you can't probably hear that but you can hear that when you listen to it with your stethoscope so you always want to assess that and make sure that it's working um, usually hemodialysis is three times a week Monday Wednesday Friday or Tuesday Thursday Saturday um, now one of the things the new things that they're doing they do hemodialysis at home now um, I'm not sure if they do it for kids I have not heard that but um, about six months ago someone um, said yeah I'm doing my my family members hemodialysis at home and that just kind of blows me away there are so many moving parts and infection control processes um, but these are this is being done at home now so it's great for you to have a knowledge of how things work like that um, just so you'll know that was a freebie um, okay some things to look for here's the the real or the AV fistula or AV graft. Um, again, feel the thrill, listen for the brewy. Okay. All right. Avoid taking blood pressure in the arm with a graft. That um, hopefully will make sense. All right. And then renal transplantation um, is again how you cure in-stage renal disease in kids. Um, kidney transplants can be living related transplants. Um, you hear that a lot. With kidney transplants you always have to make sure that you assess for any sort of rejection. Um, if any of signs, if you see any signs and symptoms of infection or rejection they need to know to come to the nephrologist immediately. Parents need to know that. Um, lots of teaching done there. Immunosuppressants are usually given, or always given, uh, but then they suppress your immune system. So infection control is very important. And then lots and lots and lots of education and psychosocial support. All right, so let's talk really quickly about reproductive um, organ disorders. This is a picture of labial adhesions in a little girl. Again, those are treated with um, Premarin cream. Um, younger girls, usually infants, you see this more in infants. Um, okay, vulvovaginitis. Again, that can be a yeast infection, that can be just an irritation from uh, wet bathing suits, etc. It's kind of a big broad category. How do you treat it? You treat it with an antifungal if it's a yeast infection. You use some really good teaching. Parents get your babies out of their wet bathing suits. I know it lists that nowhere in here, but that's one of the things that we teach them. Um, make sure front to back wiping, cotton underwear, etc. Um, PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, um, usually caused by chlamydia or gonorrhea. Um, there's your Abdominal pain, fever, pain with intercourse, etc. That's what you're looking for. Um, you always want to ask about if a if a patient if a if they come in with any of these complaints if they're sexually active. Um, really important. Okay, um, there's some that kind of goes with the vulva vulvovaginitis. Uh, what we're going to treat with antifungal creams or oral flagell if it's a fungal situation. Here's some things you want to assess for in your health history with looking for PID or sexually transmitted diseases. Um, prevention of PID. Make sure that they are um, educated on condom use. Alright, so this table lists the menstrual disorders and um, don't really need to know these at this point. Um, yeah, you, you can read through them. Interesting information. 
All right, so we're going to skip over to male disorders, and we're going to talk about phimosis and paraphimosis. Um, in phimosis, the foreskin can't be retracted, and with paraphimo paraphimosis, um, it's where it's constricted behind the, the glands of the penis. So that is a... Um, that's a big problem because you can cut off the circulation there and um, get some necrotic tissue. So um, it's a surgical situation a lot of times. And circumcision sometimes is the outcome of that. Um, whoops. Here's some teaching information for um, if your parents choose not to circumcise their baby, this is what they need to do to take care of it. They need to... Um, Pull back the foreskin um, as far as they can without totally, you know, retracting it. Clean it. Um, if it doesn't go back all the way, don't force it. Um, change diaper very frequently. Um, dry the area. If you can pull the foreskin back, make sure everything is dry before you um, replace the foreskin because yeast can grow in there if there's, if there's water or if there's moisture. Um, circumcision, this is, talks about circumcision, managing pain for circumcision. Of course, um, the outcome is to prevent infection, um, good teaching, post-surgical. Well, they call it a procedure. They don't call it surgical. But um, they tell you clean it with clear water for the first days. Of course, don't put alcohol on it, etc. Um, some things to look for if baby doesn't go pee six to eight hours after the procedure um, or if there's serious, serious swelling, then those are all situations that need to be investigated. Cryptorchidism is an undescended testicle, and that's usually corrected surgically. Um, providers will assess testicles on um, males just to make sure they're both descended like they should be. If they're not, they will um, try to do it manually um, because you can kind of bring down a testicle from the inguinal canal, um, but if it doesn't stay, then they need to go fix it. Um, hydrocele and variceal. I'm sorry that there's not a picture of these, but um, it's when fluid comes down through that inguinal canal into the scrotal sac, and it um, it, caught, it it's not really swelling; it's just fluid filled, and so it looks really large compared to the rest of the anatomy. There, um, you can actually illuminate through the testicle if you're if you're thinking that they have a hydrocele, and it's just kind of it, you can see the fluid in there. You can see the testicle, and then you can see the fluid. Um, a lot of times these are resolved by about one year, um, but if they don't, then um, sometimes they have to go in and surgically close that inguinal canal up so that the fluid won't go back and forth. Testicular torsion, we talked about serious, serious stuff, um, surgical emergency, um, swelling, if they, if they appear hemorrhagic or blue and black, then that that's a, uh, a late sign. Uh, red and swollen is what you'll see initially, um, but once they lose that circulation, then they become pretty cyanotic, if that's the right word to describe it. Um, Epididymitis, remember, is bacterial in nature. It's treated with an antibiotic, um, lots of fluids, and... Um, Make sure that you screen for um, any kind of STDs as well. All right, and then here is our nursing care plan. Um, talks about psychosocial issues as well as well as um, physiological things like fluid balance, um, nutrition, etc. All right.